So, Karim, what's first of all the design for you? Uh, design for me is when we really focus on the present uh, on every level. So we use all the criteria of the present, for example, social behaviors, new technologies, new softwares, new materials, um, you know, um, and, and we build the project around that. So we're doing something that's not at all taking or stealing or being derivative of history. We're kind of working in the present to shape the future. That's what design is. And the color inside the context, uh, the white and the colors, the, what's the relationship between them? Well, I like, I like very, very strong colors and that came from, from the days of the beginning of the computer, really. When I started in the 80s using computers, I loved the colors would come from the screen, you know? The CMYK, the vibrancy of magenta and cyan. So I started using them in my work to somehow talk about and mirror the digital age because I think the physical age should be as up to speed as the digital age is. Plus, color is a powerful entity. It's a powerful sense, and it's a beautiful sense, actually. It's amazing how we can kind of shape a better, let's say, human psyche and human memory by using color. So, so let's try to talk about the, the time and the time that goes by. So, uh, digital era today, analog era in the past. So, yes. how do you see that? Well, the, you know, the, the I mean, this is just kind of a uh, theory I have, actually, that that I took a long time to figure this out, but I realized that the world was built in the analog era. So, and the analog era was all about material. And even to the point of where we believed that we would have immortality through precious stone and precious material and golds and diamonds. And we kept raping the earth of everything from copper and iron ore to oil. And that was very much the analog world. And the industrial revolution was even more so this kind of destruction of the earth. And along comes this thing called the digital age, which is really based on it, nothing. It's based on zeros and ones. It's brilliant. And zeros and ones made it a, a world that's more communicative than ever before in history. It's made a world's boundaries and borders disappear. It's empowered the individual. It's empowered creativity. And I could go on and on about what the digital age has brought us. So with all these incredibly heightened experiences, which is all, by the way, very new, because it's only 40 years old. And for most of us, it's only really 10 years old. We are only at the beginning of it. So the, and the big, so the big question is, is it around the digital age to kind of save the earth because we're not going to need to be so material anymore. But as a designer, I also want to talk about that by shaping objects that are very light or objects that are a little more immaterial or objects that are very easily recyclable or disposable or objects that are um, biodegradable or things that, are, that speak about this forever changing kaleidoscopic digital age in which we live. So this morning, when I introduced you to the audience, we talk about the future for an artist. For, what's the future for you? Uh, the future for me is uh, to try to start designing more and more of things that will really save the planet and help the Earth. But with that said, without being cliché. And what I mean by that, for example, is we see for in most interior design and in design a lot. We even still see it in cars, you know, bits of wood. Wood is an example. The wood we're looking at is all superficial. It's just surface. It's not real wood. I mean, these shelves here are not real wood. So it's all pretense, right? So I want to kind of break all that those old archetypes that if it's not wood, why make it look like wood? Meaning, and when I say that is, the future for me is to do projects that people would never think are 100% biodegradable, yet they look like a future plastic world. I'm doing, a, I just finished a chair made from a chai fruit injection molded and a chair injection molded from um, the origins is sugar cane. And it's fantastic. You would never even know. You would think it's polypropylene or whatever. This is the kind of world I want to shape, so. Okay. This morning we talk about style and design. How can I explain the relationship or the differences? Yeah, st style is uh, when you borrow from history, you're styling. If you're derivative from history, you're styling. If you're designing, you're not looking at history for inspiration, you're looking at the present for inspiration. So I think it's that simple. Now, it, they, those two things could blur. For example, if you make like, I don't know, Philippe Stark made 12 years ago, whenever with Cartel, he made a chair that looks like a French you know, Louis XV chair, but he made it in clear polycarbonate. He's kind of, one hand, clear polycarbonate is a really recent technology and material. At the same time, he's borrowing some form and style from the past. So he's kind of, in a way, that's his 
that's his thing in life, I guess, is to take from the past and kind of reinterpret. But in general, if you're just taking from the past and you're imitating, you're just dialing. If you're working in the present, you're designing. I think it's, it's, it's for me, it's finally clear cut too. That took me about 25 years to figure that one out. <laughs> is it a fight between a designer and his audience? Is, uh, is public or there's a relationship, a strict relationship? If, 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 if there's a fight, you're not designing because design is about the public. Design is a public act. It's a social act. It's an economic act. It's a political act. It's a creative act, you know? So the ideal thing is if I'm actually going to design for, for design, I'm designing for people. And the original definition of the Industrial Revolution was this notion of a betterment of society, using machines to produce goods for a larger audience, right? That was the agenda. So if most people are loving what you do, you're doing a good job and you're designing. So what's the relationship between you and your fans and the people that's following you? I have a very close relationship. What I mean by that is, you know, for example, my fan book page, I have 400,000 followers and it's, I answer personally maybe 30 or 40 messages a day from there. I'm very proactive on all social media myself, not I don't have assistants doing it, I do it all myself because I really want to connect with people and I'm very approachable and very accessible. I have no qualms about trying to be this mystical hidden celebrity or something. I'm very like out there because I'm A, learning from them and I'm learning what they appreciate or don't appreciate about what I do and even more so, I'm inspiring them especially the younger audience and the younger designers. I know that I'm putting a lot out in the world because of my, I have a responsibility now and I think anybody who gets well known has a responsibility. And that responsibility is to realize that the next wave of, of your profession are watching you. And if they're watching you and listening to you, you better do responsible things. So no boundary for design and not for designer. That's true. I see, I like a world with no boundaries and I have no boundaries, yes. I love that, that's, nice. that's quite poetic. Okay, that's, that's all and thank you very much, Karim. Grazie mille, thank you.